shoes when I lived in Toronto and I was doing uh, street theater and parades and things to teach people about GMOs uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, trying to get the word out about what was happening um, in our country and trying to get labeling, none of that happened. Um, so I decided I would learn how to grow food so that I could grow food that wasn't GMO food so mm -hmm. that there was more choices out there and to learn what I could about how to grow things better, our food better, in my opinion. So um, I did some training, like, worked at different farms in BC and around Peterborough, and then finally I did a CSA, Community Sponsored Agriculture, with a couple of other women. We fed 20 families, and I was doing that for about three years, and then I had children. <laughs> I didn't do that for a while, but I grew our food. And um, I started studying more about uh, fruit trees and edible landscaping and things like that. And in that journey, I studied to be a master gardener, which is a couple of years of study. Either go to a, a university in Guelph or Nova Scotia and do courses or online, or you can do self-study. That's what I did because I went and took an organic master gardener course out in BC and did self-study and wrote an exam for that. Um, as part of my journey. And then three years ago we moved to a property in Warsaw and I've been working on using permaculture principles to develop it because it, it's not a farm. So it will be a farm. So projects we're working on, um, my husband's put a greenhouse over this in Grand Swimming Pool and he's working on aquaponics in there. So he's in the greenhouse planting. So growing fish and plants together and making a system. Um, I have a project to, I've pl been planting fruit trees, I'm going to turn one area into a forage, a forest forage, forest forest forage area for the chickens um, this year and I'm expanding the herb bed in front and doing some windbreaks along the north side with some pine nut trees and some hazelnut trees. So, and I'm getting more nut trees planted this year. So those are the type of the projects that we're working on and learning about it as we go. So I'm going to tell you as much as I know now. So far, we've just been there three years, so we're, we've got the knowledge of that much and, and a lot of theory as well that I'm using to move forward. So that's what I'm going to pass on to you. And I can answer probably a lot of your questions, but not all of them because you know, I only have so much experience. Um, but does anyone know, first of all, so is there any questions about that? Um, how I want this class to go is that I'd like everyone to be involved. The screen is not there just to focus on because I want us all interacting. So I'm going to ask you to try and give your input so that your brains are working. And so I'm not the only one talking, which could get boring. So this is here kind of instead of me writing on the board. This is what I'm using it for. So first of all, permaculture. Does anyone know or have an idea in their mind what that means? Permaculture. Anyone? Something to do with permanency. Permanence? Good. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. So the perma is for permanence. He's planting the permanent perennial vegetables, and, and, and that's an intriguing idea. Yes, sir. I will talk about some perennial vegetables, and mm -hmm. that has to do with perennial stuff, but it can be mm -hmm. annual stuff, too. So permanent culture comes maybe from two different terms. Permanent culture or permanent agriculture, it can be applied. It doesn't have to do with food necessarily. It's about setting up, well, I'll, I'll click the definition I've got. Um, it, it talks about making a system, either in your own household or in your community, that avoids waste going out and avoids bringing stuff in that you're not producing. So it's trying to set up a system that's a permanent culture or permanent agriculture within whatever area that you're looking at, but it's not global, it's smaller. So instead of things going, you bring in packaging in from the grocery store and then packaging and, and the food comes from somewhere else and then you eat the food and you throw the packaging out and then it goes out again, well you don't want to do that. So you don't need to necessarily look at, even if you have no room to plant anything, you can still set up better systems within your household that are more a permanent culture. Not creating waste that's going out, creating waste you can use, and not bringing things in that you're not creating yourself. So 
that's basically, so I mean it's old school because that before our current systems of agriculture and when people were living in smaller communities, that's what you did. So really it's not a new concept, but we need to make it new because our systems are different now. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So there's a man named Bill Mollison, and there's some other people, and they're the ones who coined that term, permaculture. They're from Australia, and this book is the introduction to permaculture. So you'll see, I'm talking for two hours tonight. There's a lot more you can learn, because there's a lot more than two hours in this introduction book to permaculture. So there are two week courses that you can seek out if you're interested in getting more in depth. And certainly looking, reading this book is really interesting. Um, so it talks about a lot of different systems you can think about. So, so we're going to look at the principles of permaculture today. And we're gonna, I'm going to apply them to edible landscaping. So when we talk about each principle, we're going to look at plants. And the plants we're going to look at are edible plants. So that's where we're going to go. But please keep in mind that these Principles don't have to be applied only in that direction when you're talking about permaculture. Okay. So, the first idea is relative location. So, what you're picturing is probably what I picture in my mind, because we're going to be talking about plants, is your yard, or maybe your balcony, or you're just your household in general. So, that's probably what you have control over. Now, if you live in a small community, you might think, oh, well, but I could bring my neighbor in, and then this would work this way. So, but what you want to focus on is what you, you have control over, or what systems you can make within your. So, usually, we're going to be giving examples of a yard, and what you have around your house. Not really looking at the systems inside, because we're talking about plants, but you can take your brain in there. So the first one is to get a design component to function efficiently. We have to put it in the right place. So if you think of a herb garden, if you've got five acres and you put your herb garden at the back of your property, that's not very efficient because you're probably never going to harvest those herbs. And if you have a windbreak and you put it on the south side of your house, that's probably not where the wind is coming from. It might be, depending, you might be in a strange situation, but it's probably coming from the north or the northwest. So you have to put all the different things that you're putting in the right place so that they're going to be effective and that you're, they're going to be useful to you. So that's the first principle. So this is all a design, you're designing things as you go along. Okay, so the next one is that each element performs many functions. So, we're going to look at a chicken as an example. So, if you have a chicken, you've got to think of, okay, I'm getting this chicken. And you've got to think of all the functions that the chicken performs, or all the products it produces, or all its needs that it has, to know where to put it, and to know how it's going to fit into the system. So, you do that with a plant. If you choose a plant, you would do the same thing. So, for the chicken, for example, you need to look at, you know, what it produces. So it produces eggs, meat, feathers, or some things you could use. Um, manure. That's really, that's mostly why I have chickens. I like the eggs, but I want them there for the manure for my garden. So that's mostly why I value them. Um, methane I don't use, but you might find a use for the methane. Um, CO2. And then what do chickens do? They scratch, they forage, they fly, they fight. So you've got to take into consideration what they do. So that is the second. So and what they need, shelter, and they need dust to scratch in, and what do they, so those are all the things they need. So you need to consider that is the second principle. Permaculture is for each element, you've got to figure out what it produces, what it needs, what it does to fit it into the system properly. Yeah? So an example. So, if you're talking about a plant, there's things you need to consider. And it's really important, actually. Um, so if I'm going to plant a pine tree at my house, there's some things I need to consider. Any ideas of what I'd consider if I was planting a pine tree? Soil. OK, the soil. type of soil you have. So what soil does it need? So these are its needs. What else? How close it is to your house. Yeah, so that would be its form. So you've got to think of 
the shape of the tree, but a tree, however big it is on top, is that big and more underneath. So you've got to think, okay, I'm planting it this close to my house, what about my foundation? Okay, what about if it falls in the wind? You know, you have to think of how far to plant it from a house. And usually, you're going to try and plant it at least um, half of its height away from the house. Okay, so you don't want a big pine tree right up because it's going to interfere with the systems of the house if you plant it. So, yes, when you plant a plant, any plant, you've got to think of how much is underground as well as what's above. And you've got to think of what shape it's going to take once it grows. There are lots of different pine trees. You want a pine tree? Well, there's short ones, and there's really 100-foot tall ones. So you can just choose the type you want. So what does a pine tree give us, then? What is it going to provide? Shade. Shade, yeah. Wind break, if you plant the wind if you want. Break. Yeah. So if we want it to provide shade, and it will all year round, where would we put it in relationship to our house? Yeah, it would depend on your windows. Would we plant it on the south side of the house? No, why? Because you want sun in the winter. You want sun in the winter. So what type of tree would you plant on the south side of the house? Deciduous. A deciduous tree, yeah. And then also, if it's a windbreak, well, the south side probably isn't going to function that way, so you're going to put it on the west. north and west. That you've got to figure out where your wind's coming from before you plant, and then you plant it as a windbreak. One pine tree is not going to give you a windbreak, though, because the wind just goes around one pine tree, so you need a row of trees. But yeah, you're going to put evergreen trees north, northwest of your house to stop the wind, and then they're not going to shade your house, and then you'll put deciduous trees on the south side. So these are some things you decide with plants. Um, any, so it gives us shade, and it gives us windbreak. Anything else you can think of with a pine tree? Pine cones. There's the habitat. Pine cones. What's in the pine cones? Pine nuts. Pine nuts. So if you, so I'm ordering three different varieties of pine nuts. So this year, not all pine trees have big enough seeds to give you a pine nut, but there are a lot of varieties that grow here that will. So there's another option if you want to grow some food. Well, then you grow pine nut trees. So um, there's a place called Roars. You want to look at some nut trees that grow around here. Can everyone see that? Roars Nut Farm. They're in Niagara. They'll deliver here, though. So or you can go there. So if you're interested in them being edible as well, then that works. Um, OK, some other things you might want to figure out with a plant. Is it annual or if it's perennial? So that's good to know when you plant it. Is it going to stay there or is it, do I need to replant it next year? So that's another thing with plant you're going to decide. Okay, uh, also, anything else if you're choosing a plant? Even a pine tree. Let's say we now need to choose the pine tree. We're looking at the height of it because maybe we want to plant it near the house. Wherever it goes, we need to know how big it's going to get. What else do we need to know about the pine tree before we plant it at our house? Does it need a lot of sun? Yep. How much sun it needs, yep. Condition of the soil, whether it's What type of soil it needs, yep. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anything else? Whether it's local to the area. Yeah, so we usually we'd say zone for that. We need to know what zone it grows in. Does anyone know what zone we're in here? Is it five? Five's pushing it. And if you're going to get something that's an ornamental, you can probably push it. If you're going to get something that's edible, then pushing it isn't, I wouldn't recommend it because then it's not going to fruit as well, which is mostly what you're probably looking for is the fruit on an edible thing. So you're going to look for zone four or lower. The zones go lower as you go further north. So if you get a zone four or lower, then that's better. Especially, um, Aslan, Aslan was talking about how our climate is changing. And what the zones are is basically and one of the main tenets in Canada, how we do our zones. Oh, and Canadian and American zones are different. So make sure you're looking not at a USDA zone, but a Canadian zone. Um, as the temperatures, the lowest temperature is on there. 
So zone 4 is like minus 30 or something like that. And then you go to zone 3 and you might get down to minus 35. So if you want a perennial plant to survive, then choosing one that has a lower zone is going to give you more leeway if we have a harsh winter, that it'll get it through. Okay? And also, if you choose a zone 5 plant, it might live, but it might not fruit well. So you're going with that. If you're choosing, even when I get a zone 4 fruit tree, I try and shelter it in a little nook. Get a little uh, microclimate on the south side of the house or something like that. So you can choose spots like that. Anything else we have to think of? Someone mentioned the acidity, and that's called the pH. I think that should be a capital. So the pH is how acidic or alkaline a soil is. You don't really have too much control over that. There are ways you can say, well, try and change it by doing this or that, but it's going to want to return to where it was. Um, most things grow in the type of soil we have here. But if you're going to try and do a blueberry bush, it's going to need more acidic soil. So you're going to need to take that into consideration when you plant it and see what you can do to help it. I'm planting pine trees. Pine trees, their needles are acidic, so I'm putting blueberries to the south side of my row of pine trees this year just to help them have more acidity. Okay? There's other things you can add to the soil and things like that, so it's finicky. Is but, chicken manure good for acidity? Um, it would be kind of basic. You never put any manure on until it's not manure anymore because it would burn your plants. So yeah, I think it probably would be acidic if it wasn't broken down, but plants don't like it not broken down. So you got to wait. Okay, so any other ideas about that? Is that one understood? Mm -hmm. Some plants don't like each other, so you can <laughs> Some plants don't like each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we'll talk about that now, and if it comes up later, mm -hmm. then we'll talk about. It. We won't talk about it then. Mm -hmm. So there are certain plants that don't like each other. The main things you would look out for. Did you have an idea when you said that? Well, I was thinking about the walnut, but mm -hmm. just. Poisons the whole, uh, yeah. can poison the whole back here. So black walnuts, sorry, go ahead. If we're talking about pines, yeah. apparently pines and red currants can be planted together. Do you know? I didn't know that one. Okay. They do like each other or they don't? They, they don't, don't like each other because the currant will carry, carries Oh, I'm rocks. sorry, yes. Not mm -hmm. just the red currant. So the mm -hmm. whole ribase family, which is currants, and that's a good point, or gooseberries, um, and there's relationships between other plants like this too. There is um, what's it called? Black white pine blister rust um, is the full name of it, and it's with white pine specifically, I think, because it's called white pine blister rust. And uh, the government, 50 years ago, said nobody's planting any more currants or gooseberries because it is the alternate host for a white pine blister rust, which kills pine trees doesn't kill the gooseberries or the currants, although it does often make them lose their leaves and not bear as well. But what it will do if you plant them close to each other is you might lose your pine tree. So, but there are resistant varieties, so if you want them, then you need to check that out and research it and try and find someone. I don't, Titania is one, I think there's a list that I don't have in my head but you can search out ribes um, that will not perpetuate that cycle. And with the black walnut, black walnuts and um, butternuts, um, also pecans and heartnuts to a lesser extent, so they're probably not so bad, but definitely the black walnut has juggalone in it, and what it is, it's a chemical that's throughout the whole tree, its roots, its leaves, everything, and it's to discourage other black walnuts from going close to it. But it discourages other things as well. Not, not a lot of things, though, but you need to research. So um, I had a black walnut tree in my yard before I moved, and I grew most vegetables under it. But you cannot grow any of the tomato family. No tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, none of those will grow. And apples, no. There's a bunch of fruit trees that will not grow underneath it. So, and strawberries won't grow. So if you have a black walnut, you need to go on the computer when you want to plant something and say, black walnut 
tolerant strawberries, and then you'll get a list up and it'll tell you where it's at. Yeah? I heard one time, maybe like many years ago, but except maybe I didn't hear it because I've never, uh, no one has ever confirmed this for me, but I heard that the locust family, like black locust and honey locust, both have a juggle and like chemical families that inhibits growth and anything. Have you ever, like, is that? No, and I had a black locust. It does spread its roots everywhere. So if it's near your garden and you dig up the soil, it'll find that spot and pop up on your tree from its roots. So they spread it everywhere. That's the only problem I had with it. I never noticed it having an effect on anything I was trying to grow. Okay. Um, so the next tenant is that uh, each important function is supported by many elements. Show you my pictures. Explain that. So, one important function if you're growing plants is you need water. You have to have it, or you're probably going to lose your plants because the new plants need to be watered. Annual plants, as they're beginning, need to be watered. So, for something as important as water, you're going to need to make sure you have more than one way to support it in case one way fails. Okay, so that's a tenant of permaculture. So if you got a tap, fine, but then having a rain barrel as well as your backup. Or maybe you've got a pond or a stream or something as your backup. So make sure if something's important in your setup that you've got a backup system to use if one thing fails. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a plant example of that. I don't think so. I mean, of course, a plant example of that is you're not going to just plant one food crop and that's it, all potatoes, that's for me, and then there's a blight and it gets all your potatoes. So, yeah, try and have a variety of greens and a variety of different things that you're planting so that if one thing doesn't work, you got something else to back you up. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay, so this is why I like to talk about this one. So we're going to spend some time on this. So, in permaculture they do zones and this is how you decide where to put different things, is what zone it should go in. And that has to do with how often you need to visit a certain area. So whether it be your herb garden or your vegetable garden or your chickens or going to get fuel or whatever, how often do you need to visit that area and the more often you need to visit it, the closer it needs to be to your zone zero which is most likely your house, but it could be your barn, or it could be just the spot that everything's radiating out from. So, go ahead and say it's your house. So, your house, that's zero, is where we're starting. And how it works is that you're going to go out from there, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, out from your house. Now, most of us in the city are not going to get past zone two, probably. Okay, but if you have a larger property, it'll go I'll tell you what all the zones are, but we'll just concentrate on the first couple. Okay, and a really important thing is you're always going to start closest to the house with whatever project or garden you're planting, because if you leave the house with weeds and untended and decide to put your vegetable garden you know, down that path, it's going to get less care. So you start in as close as you can and work your way out with your projects. And it, it does make a difference. I'm like, oh yeah, whatever, I want this over here. But then, you know, that further garden actually gets neglected. And the garden that's close to me gets weeded more often and picked more often. And so you really need to put things that need more care close to the house. All right. You always work your way out from there. If there's weeds out your back door, there's probably going to be weeds further along too. So this is kind of blurry, but it gives you the idea. You got your zone zero, then your zone one, two, three, four, five as you go out. Now it might not go like this because if there's a ravine or something coming in as a slice, now that ravine with the steep bank might become your zone five and it might come right up to your house, but it's not very usable. So you need to decide, to decide where your zones are, depending on you know, how, where the door comes out of your house or if how the landscape is. 
So it might not just be a circle. Because around the north side of my house, there's no doors going that way. And it's close to the house, but it's really hard to get to. So it becomes a zone three because I can't get there so easily. And I never walk past it unless I make the effort to. So you'll need to decide how your zones work at your place. Okay? Yeah? Oh, what, sorry. What would we put in zone one then? Sitting in flares. That's <laughs> one. So you'll want to do that. I mean, that doesn't sound so radical or anything, but we do want to sit and play, so that's important. Um, anything else that we put near the house? Herbs. Yeah, that's important because you're probably not going to use your herbs, and you really would like to if they're further away. So right outside the door, and they're beautiful, so it's nice to have them close to the house because herbs are really great. Um, anything else? Salads. Salad greens, so things you would pick fresh. Yeah. So when you're talking about um, which vegetables, you'd want your salad greens close to the house. But the potatoes, you're going to dig them up once a year, so you don't really need to have them close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else close? Edible mm -hmm. flowers. Yeah. Again, there's beautiful things close to the house. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Think about non-plant things. What else do you need to cook? Because if you're planning, even where a garden goes, you need to first use up those spots for things that actually need to be close to your house before you can put the garden there. So if there's other important things, you've got to find a spot for them as well. Water. Water? And water source. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe your tools for garden tools. Yeah, you might want your garden tools quite close to the house. Yeah. Fuel supply might be close to the house. I mean, we burn with wood. It's got to be close. If our wood's there before, like in the field, we're cold. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have that close to the house, and it needs to take a place. We need a place for it. Okay. So your vegetable gardens are probably close. This is my vegetable garden at my last house. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Because you can make vegetable gardens beautiful. It's just how you plant things together. But you can have a lot of fun with it. If you think about the form of, of everything and you plant them. That's yeah. not just yeah. you know, garden rows. So yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah, rows are not very efficient. But that's a whole other lesson on vegetable gardening. But yes, I don't garden in rows because it's not efficient. So intensive gardening. No, it's not very yeah. Intensive, yeah. It's intensive. It, the square foot gardening comes from an intensive method, but you don't have to do it in square feet. Um, that's an older idea is the intensive method, so you can look that up if you want. More information. So herb gardens you can go near the house. Now mine's out in my front yard because they really are beautiful. Um, this is a spiral herb garden. And the reason this is good is because, again, intensive. Uh, we have five acres where we are now. A lot of it's forest, but I still, I want to pack as much in there as possible. So we're starting close to the house and we're getting things packed in. And this is a good way because what you're doing is you're going up. Anytime you can go up, you're going to use less space. Because if you can spill over the sides, you have more edges, which we'll talk about later. So. You can plant things that trail, and they're not going to trail on the ground. They're going to trail over the edge, and you're going to get a lot more space that way. And most herbs are from the Mediterranean and don't need a lot of water. So they're okay with being raised up and that sort of thing. So you can, again, go on for herb beds and find a lot of different ways to build them. People use bricks or stones or logs different ways that you can, so whatever you kind of have around, you can get creative. You just need to be able to, to hold the dirt up in that spiral kind of pattern. So it's easier on your back too. Yeah, you don't have to bend. And herbs are perennial, so you don't have to be digging that soil up. And you don't want to be digging soil up, because if you dig up soil, in a tablespoon of soil, there are more living things than there are people on the planet. And they live in the soil as a whole other ecosystem. And through the layers of soil, there's different amounts of air and water in each layer. And the things that 
that like those different layers go there and form communities. And the plant roots need those communities because there's fungi and, and bacteria that help bring nutrients to the plant and share. The plant gets the sunlight, makes the carbon, trades that with what's under the ground, and they bring the plant nutrients. Now, if you're disturbing those ecosystems, then you're, you're disturbing the, the plant's ability to make those relationships and to thrive. So you want to disturb the soil as little as possible in any situation. No plowing, so, no rotom tilling? If you can help it, yeah. Raise beds if you can. Mulch them because rain compacts. Don't ever walk on them. Have permanent paths that you walk on. That's it. Just try and loosen the soil in the spring. Don't even plant right after you've loosened it because those, um, you, you just destroyed whole ecosystems. Those things will come back, but if you're seeding, it's good to wait. You know, disturb it, and then maybe the next day after you've loosened it, you can get your seeds in. They need those things going on in the soil. It's really important. So, yeah, no-till is really important. Also, if you're talking about greenhouse gases, um, plants trap carbon, and they, they, a lot of plants are really good at taking that, those high polluting carbons out of the air and storing them back in the earth. That's what happened, is we, we took the fossil fuels, which were plants and things, and stored all of that, and now we're putting it back. Plants store that. And anytime you till the soil, you're releasing it back into the air. So some does release anyways if you don't till. But a lot of more will stay stored if you don't disturb the soil. So leaving it there, it's just like nature. You just have to, what does nature do? Oh yeah, it leaves this layer of leaves or grass on top of things. It doesn't turn things up, right? And things are always growing, so you always have loose soil, and you always have roots <coughs> there for all of the creatures that live under the ground. Because near the roots, those are where the ecosystems are strong. So you want to think just what does nature do and it knows what it's doing, right? So it'll follow those things. Okay, do you want to talk about now some of the different herbs that we can grow around here? If you want to get, we'll just talk about a few, but where you want to look is um, Richter's herbs. Um, they're just outside of Uxbridge. So I'm promoting these things. When I first started to do edible landscape, I went on the computer and said, what can I grow? What can I grow? And I found all these plants. I'm like, oh, I could grow this. I could grow this. I couldn't find all those plants, anyone selling them. So then I learned, OK, well, who sells these kind of plants and what do they have? So that's a better way to go, because otherwise it's frustrating. You just won't find things. But Richter's is really amazing. They have a lot of medicinal herbs and tea herbs and, and culinary herbs and dye herbs and everything. So it's fun if you're looking for herbs. So what are some of the main ones that would be good to grow here? Does anyone have some? Oregano. Oregano, yeah. And? Chives. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to put this word here. Look for the zone. We can't grow all oreganos here. You've got to get the one that's going to be okay for a zone. Chives is fine. Chives are fine. Sage grows here. Sage, again, look for the zone. Um, well, most sages will not grow here, but yes, there'll be oh, some that can. Yeah, oh yeah, the ones that do, yes, they're gorgeous. And they're, they're perennial, like they're um, not deciduous, like they're evergreen sages. So they're really nice to put in a front garden to give color through the year. They turn all purple. Love, 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 really nice. Okay, what else? Hi. All kinds of time. Yeah, time. So time can be put in a lot of situations. Again, look for the zone, because not all times will grow here, but you certainly can get all varieties of ones that do. So they're very nice for pathways or edges of gardens. You can get really low growing ones. Um, and then there's some that grow higher. So if you want that shape. So look for the shape that you want. Anything else? Lovage. Lovage. Lovage is beautiful. So lovage is a very majestic herb. It will grow about this tall and about this wide and come up with celery. Like it looks like a huge thing of celery. It's really lovely. Yeah, someone else said something. Winter savory. Winter savory, yeah. Dill. Dill, yeah. So dill is a annual. 
I'm going to put that up here. Because you probably, if you're going to put that near her bed, you might put that maybe at the beginning when there's something that hadn't filled in yet. Because it, you need to receive it every year. And basil too is an annual. So again, in a herb bed, you might find a spot for it at the beginning, but that'll be more perennial stuff. Parsley. Oops. Parsley. Again, annual. Yeah. Chamomile. Chamomile. Chamomile has to reseed itself. So again, in a herb spiral, you wouldn't have it wouldn't be in the same place. You'd have to know exactly what it looked like so you wouldn't need it. So um, I'm just going to put that over here too. Uh, tarragon. Tarragon, yes. That grows huge. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a good spot for it. So again, you've got to know the form, the shape, how high all of these are before you put them where they're going to go. So too. And if you look at, if you get the Richter's catalog, it tells you all that information, like the paper one, and it's paper. But um, it's, it's a really good reference because it'll give you how much sun it needs and often the heights, the color of the flowers, things like that. So. Can we say not to put mint? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> mints grow really well, as well as um, lemon balms. They're really good to have. But what are you but not in a herb spiral. Not in a herb spiral because they're going to grow everywhere. So you're going to put them along a path where they can't grow out of that area. So maybe there's a spot that you mow for a path, and on this side, if there's your driveway there or something, and there's a patch, what do I do with that patch? Oh, put mint in it, because it can't go anywhere. So you're going to want to contain it in a spot that you know it can't escape from, either because you're cutting around it, or there's a pathway there. Or something. Mm -hmm. But it's good to have. It's good to think when you're planting, and you've got an enclosed space like that, oh, that's where I can put the mint, because it's nice that mint. Can you put most herbs in from seed? Some herbs are really hard to start from seed, so I'd research that before you decide it. Now, if you're doing a herb spiral and you're just doing one of each plant, it might be just as well to buy the plant mm -hmm. than to buy a package of seeds mm -hmm. when you only need one. Because most of these, all these herbs, they grow big. So you're not going to need more than one plant, probably. And then if you do just buy the one plant and you need more, then it might be easier just to take a clipping and root it than to start to start a whole bunch of seeds. Mm -hmm. These annuals, of course, you're going to start seeds. Yeah. Or you can leave the dill. Leave yeah. a few heads. Mm -hmm. And you'll have it coming up next year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Again. Okay. So, yeah, and if... We'll talk more about some other tea herbs and things like that when we talk about edible forests. So what else you're going to put close to the house? Shops, sheds, greenhouses. So I have my dream now in my house. I have my greenhouse, which is about that size, not so fancy, because um, we use recycled windows and stuff. It's on the south side of my house. My husband put a window there. So now, this time of year, the greenhouse heats up and I can open the window and the heat comes into my house. So those are the type of systems you would set up. And you, okay, what does this greenhouse do? Well, it traps heat. So what do I need in my house? And the heat. So the greenhouse is going to get too hot and I've got to let the heat out. So those types of systems are good. So that's fine. So you probably want your greenhouse close to the house because when the plants are little, you got to watch them all the time. You don't want to walk a far away. These are the things you're probably going to have to have or want to have near the house. Mm -hmm. so. But it's not fun to put up pictures of sewage pipes and stuff like that. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, so when you're establishing plants near a house, establishing gardens near the house, or your vegetable garden, or your herb garden, or whatever, um, Probably the best way to do it, and this is in the book, they say establish and complete sheet mulch. So that's him saying that, but I do that too. So you do what's called lasagna layering sometimes as well. What this does is it allows all the nutrients to stay in the place rather than taking off 
um, what's there, there's weeds or grass or whatever, and removing any of it, which removes some of the nutrients, you want to keep it there, as well as add more if you can at the same time. So you put down a layer of cardboard, and then you put some compost, and then you put straw. Or you put down newspaper and compost, it's always compost, and then you put leaves that you've collected from the neighborhood. So um, that way you're going to kill all the grass. You probably have to wait, so I do this in the fall. And then by the time in the spring I'm ready, usually it's just broken down. You move it aside the mulch that's still there and there's the cardboard's gone, the grass is gone, and it's really it's loosened up underneath because of so much stuff going down, and you can just dig it up. So if you're going to do a vegetable bed, you're going to want to double dig and get it all loose. You are turning it just the once, if you can help it, and dig it down as far as you can. And if you're doing a perennial bed, say you wanted to plant a fruit tree here, you don't have to dig the whole thing for a fruit tree. You just have to dig the hole for the fruit tree. And that's it. Get that in there. And then the things that you want to plant around it, just if they're perennial stuff, you just need to dig the spots. Always keep it mulched. If that mulch breaks down, you got to put more on. Because nature's going to fill it in because it wants to be filled in. Because the soil needs things growing for it to thrive. And it doesn't want to be left bare. So either keep it mulched or get something planted there that you want. The two things to do. Even when you plant things you want, you need to keep the mulch on there. So to do this that way, you said that you need to do that in the fall. If you, unless you wouldn't, you don't have to do it in the fall, but you got to wait. So if you want to get it dug the next spring, you're going to have to do it in the fall before. Okay. I just put a big new piece of my garden last summer. I put newspapers yeah. in this, um, but I didn't put any root vegetables into it, but I put lots of arugula and broccoli. And did you seed milk. it, or and did you put starts in? Like, did you put little plants, or did you put seeds? I uh, put seeds. Yeah. Well, I put seedlings, actually. No, seedlings. That, I, that yeah. I started. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now this summer, I'll be able to put root vegetables in. Yeah. But I didn't try because there were the layers underneath. But, but they grew. Mm -hmm. They, they, they yeah. got very luxuriant by the end of the summer. Yeah. And so, that was just starting from the beginning of the season. Yeah. I just wanted to say that. I mean, yes. So, <laughs> I always double dig my vegetable beds, because I keep my annual separate from my perennials. But, yeah. You can plant any started plant right into that, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So um, it, it looks like it's, if the manure is underneath the cardboard. Like some people put manure underneath. Some people put it on top. I put it on top because it holds down the cardboard, so it doesn't blow away. It doesn't really matter either way. But yeah, if you put it on top, then it's going to keep the cardboard down. So can I just ask you a question? Now, if I plant, say, some uh, masculine mix, mm -hmm. and I want to mulch that, mm -hmm. and I could put straw on it, right? Mm -hmm. And how deep would I put that? So, first of all, I don't mulch until things are established. Oh, okay. Okay, okay you can't put mulch over where you've seeded okay. because the seeds won't come up unless it's bare ground. Um, especially straw. Straw inhibits a lot of things that aren't grasses from growing. Okay. So it's actually really good to mulch with after your things are up because they're already germinated and then other weeds won't germinate as much. Um, but certainly if you're seeding, you've got to leave that space open until your plants are big enough to be able to weed around them because weeds will come up too. Then you mulch and you probably won't have to weed again. I don't have to weed again. I'm sure. But you'll have to do the one weeding if you're going to stretch seed. Yeah. And if your planting starts, then you just make a space within the mulch and put it down. Now the mulch I usually use is leaf mulch because it actually um, works with the back. There's different cultures in the soil, just like because we have kind of different cultures around. And Leaves decomposing create a different culture than grass decomposing. And most vegetables will do better with leaves than with straw in terms of what they want to establish the right soil. But I, always, I often use straw. It works just fine. But especially if you're going to plant a tree or something, leaves, if you can get them, are going to establish that area better than a straw because grasslands and, and forests don't like to mix. 
So what would you put instead of straw then on the garden? Leaves. Long? I use leaves you know, if I can. If you don't have them, say like I use leaves or straw because that's what you can get. Okay. I mean, you can use sheep fur. You can use I don't know. Okay. I've so, looked at different things. Okay. So what we're going to get here yeah. is is uh, straw or leaves. And if it's a more perennial bed, you can do like a, a tree mulch, like a mulch, but not bark mulch because bark has inhibitors for for different diseases and stuff. It's got chemicals in it, and a lot of plants don't like that. Mm -hmm. But something called remial. Remial wood chips. Remial wood chips are the wood chips made up from the ends of the branches, which have actually good positive things for the soil that help encourage growth. That's the type you want. So if it's a perennial bed, you can put wood chips on it. Where do you get those leaves? I've got them from a landscaping friend who I'm like, yeah, bring me that. So you just have to make sure, like, just ask where you get them. Like, search out a landscaping place or whatever. I there had a question here that well, was to have it. chips. I end up with a whole lot of chips. Yeah. Um, and you just finally mentioned chips. I'm getting really quite worried that it's not, not probably good for the vegetable garden. It might not be. They take, um, because they break down so slowly, like depending on what part of the tree they're from. The renal chips also break down a bit faster. They're from the green end, so they, they break down faster. But when things break down, they'll actually take nitrogen from the soil to, to do that. So just see, if it looks like your plants are nitrogen deficient, like they're kind of yellowing, the leaves are yellowing or they're struggling, it might be the reason because of the wood chips on them, the type that you have. Here? Uh, I like to put the maple leaves on my garden as mulch, mm -hmm. and I've been noticing in Peterborough, and it's creeping into the Bob Cation area, there's these black spots mm -hmm. all over the leaves now. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Is that still okay to use that as mulch? Or? Yeah. I mean, well, it doesn't affect the trees. As far as anyone I've asked or anything I've looked into, the trees are fine with it. Mm -hmm. It's a fungus that grows on them, likes those trees, but the trees don't seem to care. I think and you can get rid of it if you get rid of all those leaves, but your neighbor and your neighbor and your neighbor and neighbor also has to get rid of all those leaves. And so really it's more aesthetic, that there doesn't seem to be affecting the trees. I, no, I mean, I just mean about using it as mulch. No. Just, oh, it's okay. No, because the leaves have to break down anyway, so I guess they have a head start probably. But yeah, it's not going to affect the plants on the ground. It just looks so horrible, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here? Yeah. You know, I answered it. Oh, I answered it? Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, the bark chips, is, are they good for anything? Yeah, for pathways, they'd be good because okay. they would inhibit things okay. growing. So, yeah, you totally, if you can get your Not hands for, on any of that stuff, you can find a place. Don't plant the plants in it. Yeah. Put it where you don't want the plants growing. Okay. Yeah. What mm -hmm. about, um, oh, sorry. sorry, here, here, here. What about the, the wood chips? So, I. Um, Produces in a perennial wildflower garden, mm -hmm. and my husband's an arborist, so I have all kinds of wood chips. Yeah, yeah. And some bark and some more. The green little yeah. elf. Yeah. I don't pay attention to just put whatever's on there on there. Yeah. So my question is more: uh, I want to then further on they, they break down. Um, there's one end of the um, boulevard garden that needs the soil needs to be more augmented. Can I just put like? compost and stuff, and then more wood chips on top, or should I lift up the wood chips that are there? And oh, them I would rake aside the wood chips that were there myself, if yeah. it's not too much work. Trying to maintain the same layers that would naturally occur. Because yeah. the wood chips are a compost layer that would always be on the top, naturally. Mm -hmm. So I haven't experimented, but I think you would trap the wrong types of um, bacteria and stuff if you mm -hmm. put a layer underneath that was trying to break down underneath the layer that... My concern mm -hmm. is any little, like the, the reseeded mm -hmm. ones. It's like I don't want to break all those seeds away and then I have to start with mm -hmm. mine, you know? But yeah. It depends how much compost you're putting on. Yeah. If you're just putting a thin layer, it'll probably just work its way down. I think I'll just try that. Yeah. Thin just put a thin layer, yeah. And don't go to the work. Let it work its way down. Because, I mean, compost also is something that would be on the top of the soil. But if you but it's also it's more broken down than the wood chips, so that's kind of backwards. So if you could maybe put it on, let it rain, wash it down, and then put more wood chips on, that would probably be the best way to do it. Yeah. Here. What about peat moss, sphagnum moss? Um, is that a good mulch? So sphagnum moss, unless it's kept really wet, gets really dry, and then 
the water runs right off the top. So that's what I would think. I would never, I wouldn't use it as a mulch because unless you're always going to be able to keep it wet, it will just dry out and then the water won't go in anymore. Yeah. Because it's not sustainable. Yeah. yeah. It's not. I mean, I do use it limitedly because for seed mixes, rather than buying bags for starting seeds, um, I do use some of it, but I use a lot more compost um, than that. And they say you use um, husks from coconuts, but that culture principles as apply to put some edible landscaping perspective on it. Is there any more questions? Yeah. Um, so if it's people put your mounds, if you make them like the long and skinny, yeah. um, would you orient them east west or north south? It would a bit depend on how your water was flowing. So you need to figure out you don't want to track water if it's in a soggy space, so you want to let it flow. So that's important. Um, so 